Yo, what's going on, everyone? Welcome back to the JT Sports Podcast. I'm your host, JT. Real quick, do me a favor. Hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and turn on post notifications so you don't miss when we drop new content. Check us out on Apple and Spotify. If you're listening on podcasting platforms, give us a five-star review if you enjoy. All right, everyone. On this episode, I'm going to be breaking down every offense in the AFC North for the upcoming 2024 NFL season, going team by team. And then at the end, I'm going to rank them all from worst to best. Before you get into it, here's a quick word from our partner, Mint Mobile. When you pay your phone bill, do you always tell yourself, man, I'm spending way too much money on this shit. Are you looking to save? Our partner Mint Mobile has you covered with plans as low as $15 a month that give you unlimited talk, text, and high-speed data on the nation's largest 5G network. Switch to Mint Mobile right now and start saving on your monthly phone bill. Go to trymintmobile.com slash JT Sports or click the link in the description or pick comment below to get access to premium wireless for as low as $15 a month. Right now, new customers that purchase a Mint Mobile plan before May 31st will also receive a six-month subscription to Paramount Plus for no additional cost. So what are you waiting for? Switching to Mint is easy. It only takes 15 minutes to do. You can get a new phone or keep the current one that you got. Go to trymintmobile.com slash JT Sports or click the link in the description or pin comment below and start saving on your monthly phone bill and get a six month subscription to Paramount Plus for no additional charge when you sign up before May 31st. Hurry, this offer won't last long, so switch to Mint Mobile today. The Ravens had a top five offense last season thanks to the hiring of offensive coordinator Todd Munkin who elevated this unit to levels that we haven't seen before. And you know what's scary? This offense could be even better in 2024. You got Lamar Jackson coming off his second MVP award. And not just that, but he's coming off his best season as a passer. He set career highs in passing yards, touchdowns, and completion percentage. Meanwhile, he posted career lows in the rushing department. So for all you clowns that still like to use these outdated running back jokes, it's about time you go ahead and you put those to rest because Todd Munkin is relying more on Lamar Jackson's ability to throw the football than he is utilizing his legs. And with the addition of Derrick Henry signing him to a two-year deal worth 16 mil, he could be the missing piece that the Ravens need to get over the hump. Because think about it. Why did Baltimore ultimately lose in the AFC Championship to Kansas City? Yes, Lamar Jackson did have a bad interception late, and you did have the Zay Flowers fumble, but they got away from their bread and butter, which was running the football. Because despite how good Lamar Jackson threw the football last season, the Ravens still were number one in the league in rushing yards per game. Derrick Henry, he may be up there in age. He's at 30 years old, which is the threshold that we start to see running backs decline. But to me, Derrick Henry still has two, three years left of high level football because he's a Hall of Fame caliber player and Hall of Fame caliber players regress at a slower rate than normal players do. And last year he was second in the league in rushing yards. He had 1,167. He had 12 touchdowns while averaging 4.2 yards per attempt. And you're going to have good depth behind them. You got Keaton Mitchell, who probably won't be ready at the start of this season. He's still recovering from that Week 15 ACL injury that he suffered. But you still do have Justice Hill. You got a rookie that you drafted out of Marshall who has really good agility and good explosiveness. So when it comes to the running back position, the Baltimore Ravens, not only do you have Derrick Henry carrying the load, but you got good depth right behind them. But what has me so excited about how good Baltimore's offense could be this year and why I think they can be better than what they were in 2023 is the upside that they have in this wide receiver room. Zay Flowers as a rookie was Lamar Jackson's go-to wide receiver. He led the team in receptions, yards, and targets. And him going into a second season, it's only right to expect him to improve. He probably should go over a thousand yards. I could see him having somewhere around 10 to 12 touchdowns this year. You bring back Nelson Aguilar on a one-year deal who was really productive, which was pretty surprising to me because Nelson Aguilar has always been a hot and cold player throughout his career. Sometimes he'll have a good season here. 
Sometimes I have a bad season there. But for the most part, I think he's a really good fit in this Ravens offense. He had four touchdowns, 381 receiving yards, and 35 catches last year. Now, Rashad Bateman, he really is going to be the key to the Ravens offense really being able to live up to their potential because he needs to step up. This dude is a former first-round pick. He has struggled to stay on the field due to injuries over the last couple of years. And I was very shocked that he got an extension. They gave him a two-year deal, but he needs to perform this year. And Todd Munkin, a couple of months ago at the start of the offseason, said that he expects Rashad Bateman to have a tremendous season this year. So I'm going to take his word from that. But you did draft Devontae Walker, a rookie out of UNC, who could become a very good deep threat. And you got one of the best tight end duos in the league. Like when Mark Andrews went down, I was arguing with a homeboy saying that losing Mark Andrews isn't going to be as big as a loss as what people think because the dude behind him, Isaiah Likely, was an absolute stud. I watched a lot of him when he was coming out of Coastal Carolina, and he definitely lived up to my expectations. He had 30 catches for five touchdowns, 411 receiving yards, and he was second on the team in yards per catch. So you look at the talent and depth that they have at wide receiver and tight end this year, this passing attack, is going to be a lot more effective year two in Todd Munkin's system than what it was in 2023 because they were still trying to get acclimated to the terminology, still trying to learn all the plays. Now everybody has a good understanding of the terminology and whatnot. Now it's just time to build on what you already put in place for last year. Now the biggest question for Baltimore this year it's going to be their offensive line. They lose three starters. They traded right tackle Morgan Moses to the New York Jets. And offensive guards John Simpson and Kevin Zeitler left for different destinations and free agency. Now, you do bring back Ronnie Stanley at left tackle, but he's getting old and he's regressing. But you got center Tyler Linderbaum, who is probably a top three, top five center in the game right now. And most of the times when you end up having a really good center, your offensive line ends up performing at a pretty high level because the center is the quarterback of that unit. Now, I have a lot of confidence that Andrew Voorhees is going to be a really productive player. He's expected to start at left guard. He was a seven-round pick in the 2023 NFL Draft. And the only reason he fell that far was because he suffered an ACL injury at the combine that year, which tanked his stock. So the Ravens got an absolute still being able to get Voorhees with, you know, their last pick of that draft. And then you also are going to have some competition to see who's going to be starting at right guard. Most people believe that it's going to be Ben Cleveland who played well the final two weeks of last year and replaced the Kevin Zeitler. But you still have um, Amali Sala. Laou Laou, who was a six-round pick in the 2023 draft by Baltimore. He played offensive tackle at Oregon. He got converted to an offensive guard. He struggled during the preseason last year. So although there is a good chance that maybe he could start over Ben Cleveland, there also is a good chance that he might not even make the roster this year because he's a developmental project. But he has a lot of upsides, really good athlete. He's big and powerful. And one thing about those Samoan offensive linemen, more time than not, they end up being good than they end up being bad. So I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up making huge steps in development this offseason. The only thing that he's really lacking is polishing up his technique so if his footwork can get better and he can get a better understanding of playing that position he could be a mauler in the run game for Bmore this year if he ends up starting over Ben Cleveland because many Ravens fans wanted Baltimore to go out and get a proven right guard but their general manager and their head coach came out and said that, you know, we like the guys who we currently have at guard so there's no reason in wasting any draft picks on them and they also signed Josh Jones to a one-year deal who previously played for the Arizona Cardinals. And the thing about Josh Jones is that he played every position on that offensive line but center. So you get somebody who has a lot of versatility. He can play left tackle. He can play right tackle for you. And he can play either guard spot for you. So also look for him to be in the mix when it comes to that right guard spot. So if I had to give you my projection for how I think the Ravens offensive line is going to look 
this upcoming season. You know that you got Ronnie Stanley and Andrew Voorhees and Tyler Lindenbaum. And then your next two guys, you're going to have probably Ben Cleveland. And then that right tackle, you know, that's the mystery that we're just going to have to see how that plays out. But for the most part, I think the Ravens are pretty set when it comes to their offensive line. Is it going to be great? No, but I don't think they're going to be necessarily bad neither. And I think that this should be a really good run blocking unit when it comes down to their ability to run the football. Pass protection, they may still be a little bit wonky, especially with Ronnie Stanley declining at such an alarming rate. But I think your offensive line shouldn't be the detriment of you this year. I don't think that it should cost you too many games. As a matter of fact, I don't expect it to be that big of a problem once we get into the season. You would like it to improve, but... I don't see it just being so bad like how bad the Cincinnati Bengals offensive line has been for the last couple of seasons. Now, the next team that we got to talk about are the Pittsburgh Steelers. And as a Steelers fan, watching this offense for the last four years has been torture for my damn eyes. It's like this offense has been so bad. It's been times when I've watched Steeler games, this offense will come on the field, I'll go to the kitchen to grab me something to drink, and then I come back 45 seconds later, and the defense is right back on the damn field, and it wasn't because of turnovers, it's because they went 3-0. and out. Now, this offense should be way better this season than what it has been in previous years, but I still have my concerns. You hire Arthur Smith as your offensive coordinator. Now, He's been the head coach of the Atlanta Falcons for the past couple of years, and it didn't work out there. And it wasn't because he was a bad play caller. It more so is that his problem is he tries to outthink the room. Like, he tries to make things way more complicated than what it has to be. Like, you had Kyle Pitts, Drake London, and B. John Robinson, but instead of utilizing your best playmakers on offense, you're, you're utilizing your backup tight end and John New Smith. That was just really weird to me. But when he was the offensive coordinator under Mike Vrabel for the Tennessee Titans, that year they had upset Baltimore in the divisional round when they had Ryan Tannehill and Derrick Henry chugging along. Ryan Tannehill posted his career best numbers under Arthur Smith's tutelage. And I think that Arthur Smith is probably the best offensive coordinator that the Steelers have had since Todd Haley. Because once they fired Todd Haley, they had Randy Fickner, who only was hired because Ben Roethlisberger liked them, and that was Big Ben's guy. And then once you parted ways with him, you promoted Matt Canada from within. And we all know that Matt Canada should have never been calling the plays. This dude looked like a novice when he was calling the plays for the Pittsburgh Steelers offense the past two years. Arthur Smith is going to be a breath, of, a breath of fresh air as the offensive coordinator in Pittsburgh. His scheme is all about running the football and utilizing play action, which works out well for the talent that the Steelers have in place. Quarterback is where my biggest concern lies with this team. You got to pick between either old man Russell Wilson or Justin Fields. Now, me personally, I'd rather see Justin Fields out there. I get that. He is really slow going through his progressions, but I think that he's no worse than a passer than what Russell Wilson is because Russell Wilson is 5'10", so he can't throw in the middle of the field. He can't see over the offensive line. A lot of the throws with Russell Wilson is going to be outside of the numbers. And when you start somebody like Russell Wilson, you have to build the offense around him. He's not one of those guys that you just plug and play into your system. No, your system becomes the Russell Wilson system. And the problem with that is that the dude is so old, a lot of his game was built off him getting outside the pocket and him running around just making a bunch of plays, but he doesn't have that kind of athleticism anymore to be able to invade defensive linemen like how he used to and run away from guys. So he's going to have to become way more comfortable throwing from within the pocket, which hasn't really been a strong suit the last couple of years for him. Justin Fields, I believe that even if you don't get as good as a passer as what you would get out of Russell Wilson, he has potential to make the Steelers running game one of the best in the National Football League this year because he's one of the best dual threat quarterbacks that we've had in the league for over the last decade, all right? And Justin Fields can always improve. That's why the Steelers made that trade to get him because you still have a young player that has a lot of upside. 
the reason why Chicago traded him wasn't because the dude was completely trash. They traded him because he still is fairly unknown going into, what, his fifth season in the league. We still don't know what he is. And Chicago wasn't willing to gamble on that when he had the opportunity to draft Kayla Williams, a generational QB prospect. But if they didn't have that number one pick that they got blessed with from the Carolina Panthers, Justin Fields probably still would have been the starting quarterback in Chicago right now. So it's not like Justin Fields is damaged goods. It's all about if Arthur Smith and Mike Tomlin can find a way to develop Justin Fields as a passer. And they've already had tweaked some things with his mechanics. Like I read something the other night about how they got him throwing leading with his right foot instead of throwing leading with his left foot, which was unnatural for him. Luke Getze started making him do that. Now Justin Fields is back throwing the football in a way that he's more comfortable with, which should help him improve a tad bit. I'm not going to act like I'm a QB guru, but he said that, you know, he wasn't comfortable throwing leading with his left foot. Him throwing with his right foot is the way he's been throwing the football his whole entire life. So I would like to think that that's the start in the right direction for him. But outside of the quarterback position, you know, there's a lot to like about Pittsburgh's offense. You look at the running back unit, you got one of the best running back duos in the league with Najee Harris and Jalen Warren. Najee Harris is in the contract year. The Steelers declined his fifth-year option, and he's not bad, all right? He's not a bust. It's just that he hasn't played up to the level that you expect from a first-round quarter, a first-round running back, excuse me. You know, when you drop the running back in the first round, you're expecting Ezekiel Elliott, Saquon Barkley. You're expecting him to have a lot of juice. And Najee Harris just, he hasn't really displayed that. But he is coming off a career high in yards per attempt at 4.1. He had eight touchdowns, and he had another 1,000-yard season, which having a 1,000-yard season as a running back is incredibly overrated now because if you do... The math, all you got to do is have around 55, 60 rushing yards per game, and you can get to 1,000 yards. And he did get outplayed by Jalen Warren. To me, Jalen Warren is the most complete back on the Steelers roster. He's faster, quicker burst, and he has way better vision. He also is a way bigger factor in the passing game. And there was times when this offense was running through Jalen Warren. The only time they could sustain a little bit of efficiency was when they were putting the ball in his hand so to me Jalen Warren should be the RB1 for Pittsburgh this year but of course they're going to go with Najee Harris because he does have bigger size he's way more physical and he's just a throwback Pittsburgh still a running back but it doesn't hurt that they got two really good running backs you also did sign Cordell Patterson to a two-year deal in free agency who already is familiar with Arthur Smith's system and his offense. And I expect him to have a little bit of a role on this offense in some capacity, rather he be lining up in the slide or if he's returning kicks. Because, you know, the NFL, they have that new kickoff rule. For those of you guys who don't know, the kickoffs that we've been so accustomed to all these years are no longer. It's going to be similar to how they do the kickoffs in the UFL. So I think that you're probably going to see Cordell Patterson used like that. Now, another concern that I have with the Steelers offense outside of the quarterback position is wide receiver. Because you have George Pickens and then who else behind him? All right. Now, we know that George Pickens is a stud, but I feel like them trading away Deontay Johnson was a mistake because he was clearly the Steelers second best wide receiver and I think that Stiller fans took him they took him for granted because it's very hard to find receivers that are really good at getting open running great routes and creating separation all those things that Deontay Johnson did well and the Steelers didn't find a suitable replacement for him I mean they got Van Jefferson who hasn't done anything noteworthy since his second season with the Rams he played for the Falcons last year and we didn't even hear his name called like that And then they got a bunch of slot receivers. You got Calvin Austin, Scotty Miller, Quez Watkins. You got rookie Roman Wilson, who you drafted in the third round out of Michigan this year. Now, he's nice. I like Roman Wilson's game. He's not a great route runner, but he's decent enough that, you know, with a few years in this system, he can improve. And the Steelers always have a really good track record when it comes to drafting receivers in the draft. So I think Roman Wilson can be a really good player. I just don't know how effective he could be as an outside number two guy. But looking at this receiver room, you can obviously tell 
the kind of offense that Arthur Smith is going to be running. It's going to be play action heavy, getting that run game going, and then trying to bomb guys over the top because you got a lot of guys who can take the top off the defense. It's just that you don't have too many chain movers. And George Pickens, I don't look at him as a chain mover per se. I see him more as a big play guy also, somebody who you just throw the football up to downfield and he just goes up and gets it. Deontay Johnson is severely going to be missed. I'm really concerned about the Steelers wide receiver room this year. Although they do have a good track record of developing wide receivers, they only drafted one this year. Tight end, Pat Firemuth is going to be in for a big season this year. He must have a big season because he clearly is the number two option in this passing game. Now, he was expected to have a breakout season in 2023, but he got held back because of poor play calling and poor quarterback play. Now that you have either Justin Fields or Russell Wilson starting at QB and you're going to have Arthur Smith calling the plays, Arthur Smith utilizes his tight ends a lot in the passing game. Kyle Pitts, you know, he didn't have the best numbers, but it's not like he didn't use them at all. And then you also had John New Smith. And we probably are going to see a lot of two tight end sets. You're going to see a lot more of Darnell Washington. Now, Darnell Washington, I don't know if he's going to be a bigger factor in the passing game this year than what he was his rookie season when he was coming out of George you got to remember this dude wasn't really known for his impact in the passing game he was known as somebody who just was a big mauler in the run game and then sometimes you know if you give him the ball in space he'll run a couple of guys over because of how freakishly athletic he is but Connor Hayward to me could be that second tight end that could emerge in this offense as a factor in the passing game for Pittsburgh this year because I think that he does have a pretty good skill set that translates well to him being a good pass catching tight end he's not as good as a blocker as what Darnell Washington or either Pat Frymuth is but there definitely could be a role for Connor Hayward hell if Arthur Smith can find a role for freaking John New Smith he can definitely find a way to utilize Connor Hayward now this offensive line is what has me excited the most. Now, a lot of people don't care about the big, ug the big uglies up front unless it's just a unit that's just completely terrible. The Steelers have rebuilt this offensive line. They spent a lot of draft capital on this offensive line the past three years, and I think this is the season that it all comes together. You got two first-round picks at offensive tackle, Broderick Jones and then Troy Fontenot who they spent their first-round pick out of Washington on in this past year's draft. Troy Fontenot was part of one of the best offensive lines in all of college football. They won the Joe Bourne Award, which goes to the most outstanding offensive line in college football. And then you got Isaac Samalu at offensive guard, James Daniels. But don't sleep on Mason McCormick. You know, if Isaac Samalu gets injured or he underperforms this season, Mason McCormick definitely can come in. He was a fourth-round pick from this past year's draft also, and I like this guy a lot big nasty got a lot of attitude and you draft center Zach Frazier also so I mean they went heavy on the offensive line they drafted three offensive linemen which all these guys are good enough to start day one Zach Frazier personally was my favorite selection out of the three offensive linemen that they took he was arguably the best center in the draft talking to a lot of people that covered the draft he was a second round pick and he's nasty physical he should be a really good run blocker he has a wrestling background so technically this offensive line is as good as what it's been since the last what four or five years the last time the Steelers had an offensive line that looked remotely as good as what it does on paper right now was like 2016 and 2017 now overall when I think of the Steelers offense it doesn't look that good on paper you know it's going to be one of those offenses that it's going to be boring to watch. They're going to be playing smash mouth football, and then they're going to throw the football sparingly, but I definitely think it can work. You know, this is the Steelers' brand of football, and this offense doesn't need to be anything special. All they just need to be is better than what they have looked the last four years, bro, because it's been a struggle for the Steelers offensively to even get the freaking 20 points the last couple of years I think this season with you having Arthur Smith you actually have somebody who knows what he's doing as the OC somebody who actually knows how to set up plays and knows how to maximize the best that he has or the best that he has to work with the right receivers aren't that good but you got Pat Fryermuth 
who's going to be more of a factor this year. And Roman Wilson, he should be good enough to make a couple of necessary plays for the Steelers to move the chains with how good he is at getting open downfield. And then we know what George Pickens is capable of. The only thing that really is the big knock on this unit is the QB position, bro. Honestly, I, I know I was complaining about the wide receivers, but quarterback really scares me the most. When you're in the division with Lamar and Joe Burrow, and then if Deshaun Watson ever wakes the hell up, I think the Steelers are going to be in a lot of trouble. And I don't think that with how difficult this schedule is, Mike Tomlin can continue to sustain these winning seasons without getting some competent quarterback play. So whichever QB is able to step up, rather it be Justin Fields or Russell Wilson, you're going to need one of those guys to play at a top 15 or better level if the Steelers are going to be able to have success this year. But overall, this is a way better offense, at least on paper and with who they have calling the plays than what it's been in previous years. Now for the Cleveland Browns, it's the Sean Watson or bust for Cleveland this year. They have to find a way to squeeze some juice out of this man because right now he's scamming these boys out of a lot of money and they got a really good team around him. Okay, you have a nice wide receiver core. You got Amari Cooper, who's coming off another fantastic season. He had 1,200 yards, five touchdowns, 72 catches, and he was averaging 17.4 yards per catch. You got Elijah Moore, who is pretty decent. Then you acquired Jerry Judy in the trade with the Denver Broncos. And I believe that Jerry Judy may have been one of the more underrated acquisitions that any team made during this offseason this is somebody who i still believe has all the talent in the world to be one of the better wide receivers in the league the only problem with that is he has struggled with the drop season he also hasn't had the best quarterback play and he has yet to amass a thousand yards despite being a former first round pick but why i have a lot of confidence in jerry judy is that He's still one of the best route runners in the league. He knows how to get open. And if you can get open, there's no way you can possibly be a bad receiver. At worst, you're going to be a mid-level wideout, which is what Jerry Judy has been up to this point. But playing with Deshaun Watson this year, if Deshaun Watson can wake the hell up and we just get a tad bit of the Deshaun that we saw in Houston, hell, we don't even need to see the Houston Deshaun light. We just need this dude to be freaking decent. And I don't know how the hell Cleveland was 5-1 and one with him as a starter last year because the dude only had about like two or three good games before he went down with that injury. He balled out against the Titans and the Cardinals, but, you know, he struggled against the Ravens for the first three quarters, and then he put together a really good fourth quarter to get them to win that game. But this is a make-or-break year for him this year. And this offense is only going to go as far as what Deshaun Watson takes him. Because Kevin Stefanski is a really good play caller. All right, they do have a new offensive coordinator. They got rid of Alex Van Pelt, who now is with New England. Ken Dorsey is going to be replacing him. And yes, this is the dude who was calling plays for Buffalo last year, who got fired midway through the season. And Buffalo's offense did improve once, you know, they got rid of him. But that doesn't mean that this dude isn't going to be able to help Deshaun Watson improve. Because, you know, Josh Allen did give a lot of credit to Ken Dorsey for him being able to reach the point that he is in his career. He played a large role in helping develop Josh Allen. He was on that staff when they first got him. So I think that Ken Dorsey, although he isn't going to be calling plays, he can have an instrumental part in getting Deshaun Watson playing at a serviceable level. And with him not calling the plays, I don't think that the addition of bringing him in Hurts Cleveland. Kevin Stefanski is still going to be the guy calling the shots. At running back, Nick Chubb, his rehab from that gruesome knee injury that he suffered last year is going pretty well. There are articles that I've seen that have said that he could be ready by training camp in the preseason, but if not, he definitely should be ready to play come early this season, rather it be week one or week two. You got Jerome Ford, who had a breakout season, 804 rushing yards, four yards per attempt, and four touchdowns. He also was a pretty big factor in the passing game. He had five passing, um, he had five receptions in the passing game. He also had 44 catches for 319 receiving yards. You also signed Nae Himes and Deontay Foreman in free agency. So you got a pretty good and deep running back room. 
And all of these guys should be able to have a lot of success. Even Nick Chubb, even if he isn't the same player that he was prior to that injury, with how good this offensive line is, there's no way that anybody in the running back room should struggle this year. This offensive line should revert back to being the top 10 unit. Last year, they got hit with the injury bug heavy. They lost three of their starting offensive tackles, and yet they were still playing at a really good level. And a big part of that was because of legendary offensive line coach Bill Callahan, who is probably the biggest loss that Cleveland had to suffer this offseason because he left to go coach under his son down in Tennessee. So the guy who they have replacing him, you know, he's pretty good. But when you're losing somebody that has the kind of legendary status that Bill Callahan has, it's going to be hard to replace that. But they do have a lot of depth. When it comes to their offensive line, hell, like they probably have the deepest offensive line room in the league. And they're going to have some competition to determine who's going to be their two starting offensive tackles. And that's not a bad thing. It's actually a good thing. You got Dredrick Wills, who prior to getting injured last year, he was starting at left tackle. And then at right tackle, you got Dewan Jones, who played really nicely. In replace of Jack Coughlin, who got injured during week two of last year. Now, Jack Coughlin, you know, he's getting up there in age. Dewan Jones is younger. He's bigger, way more athletic. You know, if Dewan Jones ends up outplaying or outperforming Jack Coughlin throughout training camp and the preseason, there's a strong chance that we end up seeing him probably get traded elsewhere. They try to get some compensation in return for him. And there definitely are some teams that can use Jack Coughlin's services. Like, I can name plenty of teams that need him right now. Hell, the 49ers are one of them. The Raiders are up there. You know, Jack Coughlin, you know, he definitely is still really good despite the injury, despite the age. It's just that DeWan Jones is so much younger and he's so much cheaper because he was a mid-round pick and nobody really even expected DeWan Jones to be this good right out the gate. He was supposed to be a developmental guy. So there's a lot of talent on the off the line for the Cleveland Browns. They got a pretty good receiving core. I like Cedric Tillman to end up possibly being a breakout candidate if Jerry Judy doesn't end up playing well. And Cedric Tillman, he had a couple of plays last year where he laid out some really mean blocks on opposing defenders, especially the one that he laid out on one of the linebackers or defensive linemen for the Baltimore Ravens last year. It was a play-action rollout play that they had called for Deshaun Watson on one of the tight ends, I believe it was Harrison Harrison Bryant, who ended up getting motion to the left side, and then Cedric Tillman just absolutely destroyed the guy from the blind side. Like, oh my goodness, I love Cedric Tillman's game. This dude is a throwback wide receiver, great size, really physical. I hope that he gets a little bit more opportunities this year to show what he can do because I would love to have him on the Pittsburgh Steelers right now. If he was on the Steelers, he without a doubt would be their wide receiver too. And then you got David Njoku, who has started to cement himself as one of the five best tight ends in the game right now. So the Cleveland Browns offense, how successful they're going to be in 2024, largely depends on how well Deshaun Watson plays. Are they going to be able to squeeze some juice out of them? I, I kind of feel like Deshaun Watson is cooked, man. I don't think we're ever going to see the version of Deshaun that we saw in his glory days with the Houston Texans, but that doesn't mean that he can be serviceable. It's like Joe Flacco, if he can lead this team to the playoffs, I don't see why Deshaun Watson can't do the same thing. And they were 5-1 and one before he got hurt. So it's not like they weren't winning games with him. It's just that, you know, they were winning games in spite of him not playing well. And one thing you don't want to see is a guy like Joe Flacco coming off the couch and leading your team to glory and outperforming the dude who you're giving $230 million fully guaranteed to. So they got to find a way to get Deshaun Watson playing at a decent level. Like I said, I'm not expecting Houston Deshaun anymore, I think. That's long gone, but you can't tell me that he can at least be an above-average quarterback. The last, thing, the last team we have to talk about is the Cincinnati Bengals. The Bengals' offense this year has a few concerns, but Joe Burrow definitely isn't one of them. There's been a lot of talks about Joe Burrow's durability. I'm not concerned about it. When Joe Burrow is healthy, the Cincinnati Bengals are a Super Bowl contender every single season. He's the only quarterback that's active that has defeated Patrick Mahomes in the postseason game the only quarterback that's beating Patrick Mahomes in the postseason is Tom Brady 
So Joe Burrow, until somebody else is able to take down Patrick Mahomes and Burrow ahead, he's still the second best quarterback in the National Football League to me. The question is, who the hell is going to replace Joe Mixon? You signed Zach Moss to a two-year deal worth eight mil in free agency, and he was really good for Indianapolis last year. You guys may not remember this, but Jonathan Taylor, when he was having his little dispute with Indianapolis and he also had the injury bug, Zach Moss was top five in the league in rushing yards. And then once Jonathan Taylor came back, he got phased out of the offense because they had just gave him a fresh contract extension. So, of course, they had to give Jonathan Taylor the workload. But getting Zach Moss was a really good deal. And you get him for a way cheaper price than what you was paying Joe Mixon. Last year for Indy, he was averaging 4.3 yards per carry. He had five touchdowns and 794 rushing yards. You also got Chase Brown, who was drafted by... Since he in the 2023 draft, he was a fifth round pick out of Illinois. He's going to be the Bengals change of pace back, has really good speed. He'll probably be a bigger factor in the passing game than what Zach Moss is going to be. The only problem is that I don't think that he has great vision. And for a guy his size, you expect him to be a little bit more explosive. But overall, I think your running back room is pretty set. It really just comes down to how well your offensive line is going to play in. That's probably the biggest concern that you should have if you're a Cincinnati Bengals fan because this offensive line has been a serious problem ever since you first drafted Joe Burrow. And despite how much money you've invested into this part of the offense, it still had to produce the way that you thought it would. Last year, you were 25th in sacks per game allowed. Orlando Brown has looked like a massive overpay. You signed Chip Brown in free agency, but he may just be a hold over until Marius Mims is ready to replace him and end up taking one of those starting jobs he was a first round pick by the Bengals out of Georgia and Georgia offensive linemen normally produce at a really high level in the NFL when you draft the Georgia offensive linemen you normally are in pretty good hands Marius Mims this dude is an athletic monster really big in stature has really good speed really strong he's a mauler in the run game the only question is how fast is he going to be able to improve? You know, his footwork still is a little bit shoddy. His technique needs a little bit more refinement. Now, when it comes to the interior of your offensive line, outside of Alex Kappa, Cordell Volson, who was a mid-round selection in 2022, this guy has not looked it. You know, there was one game that he had when PFF graded him out to have a 9 or 0 pass blocking grade. He's pretty decent as a run blocker, but when it comes to pass protection, this dude is a huge liability. And then you still got center Ted Karras, who is pretty solid, but your offensive line is going to make or break this team this year because, yeah, you lose Joe Mixon, but you can make up for that as long as your offensive line is still able to create holes in the run lane. The wide receiver position, you know about Jamar Chase and how good he is, but what about T. Higgins? Is he going to play this year? He's the only player that's been given the franchise tag who hasn't signed his tender yet. I doubt that he holds out into this season. I don't think that that would work in his benefit. And I get that you want a long-term deal, but you, you are going to be making, what, 20 plus million this year on the tag. Hopefully the brother doesn't get injured. And you know, it is pretty wrong how Cincinnati is doing them, doing them right now, bro. The dude wants to get a long-term extension for you, bro, and you're not paying them. And I don't get why you wouldn't pay T. Higgins when you should want to keep that core round between him and Jamar Chase. I know you don't got a lot of money to keep everybody happy, but if there are some other players that you got to let go, such as Trey Hendrickson to keep T. Higgins, I think that that would be a smarter move. Trey Hendrickson starting to get on the older side of football age. I think with T. Higgins, Jamar Chase, and Joe Burrow having such a good connection, you would want to keep that duo together, similar to what the Cincinnati Bengals did for all those years with Carson Palmer when they had T.J. Huchmazada and Chao Ochocinco. So I, I really don't agree with how Cincinnati is handling the T. Higgins contract dispute. Like, just pay the brother what he wants, bro. If the brother wants to get paid like a number one, pay him like a number one. Because on any other team, he'll be a number one wide receiver. So why would you try to give this guy number two money? You know, I, I don't think you can ever go wrong with investing in your wide receiving core when, you know, Joe Burrow does need weapons to still be really good. Now, you did draft Jermaine Burton in the third round of this year's draft he has a lot of upside and 
we never got to see Jermaine Burton playing at his full potential at any point throughout his college career. I felt like his tape at Georgia before he transferred to Bama was better than what he put on display for the Crimson Tide. He has pretty good size. He reminds me a little bit of Jamar Chase, you know, pretty physical. He'll run a few guys over with the ball in his hands, but he's a really good deep threat. This is somebody who can win those one-on-one -on -one matchups downfield. He's a really good red zone target for you also. But once you get past T. Higgins, Jamar Chase, and Jermaine Burton, the wide receiver core becomes incredibly concerning. You got Charlie Jones, who you drafted last year out of Purdue. He's more of a slot guy. He's not the most, he's not the most athletic guy. He, he is a pretty decent route runner, but he isn't really anybody that's going to wow you. You got Trent Aaron, who doesn't really wow you neither. And, you know, if either T. Higgins or Jamar Chase goes down, I think they're going to be in a ton of trouble. But you did sign Mike Kosecki. You re-signed Drew Sample. I think the thing with Mike Kosecki is that he's still a really good tight end. He just has been underutilized. I thought that they would have used Irv Smith a lot more than what they did, but... I guess this offense just tends to favor wide receivers a lot more than they do the tight ends. But Mike Kosecki is really athletic. He has pretty good hands. I've seen him make a ton of crazy catches and double coverage. He can be really good in the red zone for you also. Not really a good run blocker, which is probably the reason why, you know, he, he hasn't really stuck with a ton of teams. But I, I think for Cincinnati, offensively, you could be so good if your offensive line could finally play up to the kind of money that you're paying a lot of those guys, man, because they did invest a lot of money into the offensive line. It's not like they're not trying against this, that, you know, trying isn't good enough. You know, if you want Joe Burrow to win you a Super Bowl, you need this offensive line to play at an elite level. Now, Cincinnati, they believe that this is finally the year that they can get this old line to finally gel and to finally come together. But I'm just going to take a wait and see approach with Cincy because this off the line has been a, a problem for the last four years. So in terms, when it comes to ranking every offense in this division from worst to best, at number four, I got the Pittsburgh Steelers. Obviously, with the quarterback situation, it doesn't really do them a lot of justice. You're kind of damned if you do if you start Russell Wilson. You're damned if you don't if you start Justin Fields. I think Justin Fields gives them way more upside because what he's going to bring to the run game. And yeah, he may not be as polished as a passer of, as what Russell Wilson is. Russell Wilson isn't the same QB that he once was when he was playing for the Seattle Seahawks. He can't see in the middle of the field. He does look like a better fit in Arthur Smith's system than what he did under Sean Payton. He's going to have the opportunity to take a lot more shots downfield. He also is going to be able to get outside the pocket, which is utilizing what Russell Wilson has been known for throughout his career. Your running back room is pretty good, but your receivers and tight ends are lacking. You know, you don't have a clear number two option. Training away Deontay Johnson definitely hurts you. Your offensive line looks really good, and I like Arthur Smith as the offensive coordinator, but, you know, I, I still feel like the jury's out on him. He did a really good job with Tennessee, but with how his stint went in Atlanta, just underutilizing his best players, you know, I, I really don't have too much confidence that he's going to be able to make just a complete overhaul with this offense. And this offense goes from being one of the worst in the NFL over the last three, four years to one of the best. I think under Arthur Smith, the Steelers' offense will probably be average or maybe slightly above average at best at number three i have the cincinnati Bengals. you have arguably the best quarterback in this division some people will say lamar's better than joe burrow other people will argue and say joe's better i don't really think it's worth making the argument both of these guys are elite quarterbacks and anytime they're fully healthy their teams are championship caliber with them on the field running back you got zach moss but after him, I don't really know about Chase Brown being your RB2. At wide receiver, as long as T. Higgins plays, you're going to be fine. But if he chooses to make a dumb move and just not play this season, and you got to start Jermaine Burton, then you're going to be in a little bit of trouble because I don't think Charlie Jones is going to be good enough to get the job done, and neither is Trent Aaron. It depends on how you're going to use Mike Gusecki because I do think that Mike Gusecki does have the potential to be the third option in this passing attack as long as you get his number called. So I, I don't think that 
you know, Mike Gusecki is just one of those additions that you should just scoff over. Like, they call his number. I think that he can be productive. And Zach Taylor, I think that he deserves a little bit more respect than what he's given around the league. Most people think that he's kind of the beneficiary to having Joe Burrow, but anytime Joe Burrow has gone down, he still has found ways to get, you know, solid, serviceable quarterback play. Like, if you would have told me that Jake Browning would have played as well as what he did last year, I would have been incredibly surprised. Like, there was times when Jake Browning looked like Dollar Tree Joe Burrow. So I think Zach Taylor deserves a little bit more for his prowess as an offensive mind. I think he's one of the more underrated head coaches in the game. At number two, I have the Cleveland Browns. Outside of their quarterback situation with Deshaun Watson, this is arguably the best offense in this division, man. You're going to have a top 10 offensive line. You got a pretty good wide receiving core. You got Amari Cooper. Then you got Elijah Moore, Cedric Tillman, Jerry Judy, guys who have upside to become really high-end second options. And then Kevin Stefanski, you know, with him being able to win games and get to the playoffs with Grandpa Joe Flacco, he has a lot of respect for me. And the thing with Kevin Stefanski is just that, you know, it's been a lot of inconsistency with him. Is he going to be able to get back to the playoffs again? Or is this going to be a season when, you know, they just disappoint because they can't find a way to make it work with Deshaun Watson? So with all the money that they're investing into Deshaun, he has to find a way to make it work because this team is just way too good, you know, for them to just not be able to make it back to the postseason because Deshaun Watson holds them back again. Like, this is Deshaun Watson or die for Cleveland this year. And now, number one, I got the Baltimore Ravens. The Ravens are pretty stacked. You got Lamar, who's coming off his second MVP win. You got the best running back room, arguably, in this division. You can make the argument for either them or the Browns. Either or, it doesn't really matter. Like, they got Derrick Henry, who still is going to be a bulldozer. You are pretty good at wide receiver. You could be a lot better depending on if Rashad Bateman is able to take that next step this year. But you're going to have Zay Flowers. We know that he's going to be really good. He should be a Pro Bowl caliber player this year. You got Zay Likely, Mark Andrews at tight end. So I like what the Ravens have in the receiver room and at tight end. Their offensive line is a slight concern, but I think they'll be able to have it figured out. We don't really know what's going to happen at right tackle or right guard, but I think their left side, including what they have at center, is pretty fine. So really, it's just the right side of that offensive line that's concerning. And Todd Munkin, he did an incredible job with this offense. Lamar Jackson obviously had the best season of his career throwing the football with Todd Munkin calling the plays, and I expect him to only get better year two in Todd Munkin's system. The only reason I don't have Todd Munkin rated a little bit higher is because, you know, that was only his first season as the OC at the NFL level, and plus, you know, I still have a kind of you know, bitter taste in my mouth for the play calling that we saw out of him in the AFC Championship game, bro. Like, it, it was a point where he was probably the runaway winner to win NFL assistant coach of the year. And instead, you know, you look at Mike McDonald and he ends up taking the claim for that because, you know, how good that defense was. But Todd Munkin definitely is a really good offensive coordinator. He deserves to be talked about. He needs a little bit more recognition than what people give him in the national media people only talked about him for his bad play calling in the afc championship but people just overlooked how good this dude was for the majority of last year so this is my breakdown and rankings for every offense in the afc north going into the 2024 nfl season leave your thoughts in the comment section down below if you're listening on youtube hit that like button subscribe to the channel Turn on post notifications so you don't miss when we drop new content. And remember that we're not just a YouTube channel. We are a podcast. You can find this episode and all our other ones in audio format on Apple, Spotify, Amazon, wherever you get your podcasts from the JT Sports Podcast is available. Follow us on Instagram at JT Sports underscore and on X at JT Sports underscore underscore. I appreciate you guys for tuning in and I will see you guys shortly with another episode of the JT Sports Podcast.